Welcome to this Bergen Summer Research School 2020 keynote today. I hope you are with me. It is my pleasure to introduce today's keynote speaker, Bernadette Kumar. Bernadette, you might put your video on when you want to. Bernadette um, is has many different titles that I can use. She is um, today here as a professor at the Empower School of Health in India and Kathmandu University, but she is as well a uh, part-time work, um, working at the Norwegian Public Health Institute, although she is now staying in Nepal. She is the president of the European Public As Health Association, the section of migration and ethnic minority health, she has been commissioner of the Lancet Commission of Migration and Health and many, many other things that I am not able to explain to all of you, but she's a capacity in this field that she is going to talk about. And her, her talk today will be about migration, our reality and our future. So I'm not going to say so much more because she is going to present herself when she talks. By listening to her, we are going to learn and to get inspired, I'm completely sure. For the sake of organizing ourselves, uh, you can, while she's talking, she will be like half an hour, you can write your questions in the questions and answers part in Zoom or in chat, and we will take these questions at the end, if that's okay for you, Bernadette. So with this, I'm looking forward to listen to you and to learn as I do every time. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Esperanza. Uh, I hope all of you can see my screen. Esperanza, if you can just nod. Uh, and I'd like to, first of all, thank the Bergen Research Summer School for the invitation and for giving me this opportunity to talk about a very important topic. It's migration and migration health that is our reality and our future. And what I'm going to take you through is why this is a defining issue for our health. Now, as everybody who knows me, including Esperanza knows that if I can talk about this till the cows come home. So I'm going to speak uh, a bit quickly to get through a lot of information. And I look forward to the discussion at the end of it. So what am I going to talk about? Let me see. Um, for some reason, I'm not able to, yeah, okay. Uh, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to introduce the topic to you. I'm going to give you some key concepts and definitions, what is known about migration health and what can be done. And of course, the way ahead. So let's talk about migration. There's 1 billion people on the move. And with that, please don't have an idea in your head that all these people are moving at the same time. And it's not refugees alone. 258 million are actually living in countries uh, that were not their countries of birth. So that's a lot of international migrants. And migration or migrants do not have a common definition. So international migrant, the widely accepted definition is someone who changes his or her country of residence irrespective of the reason for migration or legal status. And while we can wonder about these definitions, and there are different definitions and different categories, one thing is certain, that the migration experience, regardless of the reason, sets migrants apart from other vulnerable groups facing health inequalities. And therefore, this is very crucial because as well as facing inequalities in health status and inequity in access to healthcare and social services, migrants often experience racism, microaggression, and structural inequity. So a little bit about the Lancet Commission and the Lancet Commission, uh, the UCL Lancet Commission was developed in the light of the opportunity to realize the SDG commitments and SDG being the short form for sustainable development goals to leave no one behind and to reach first those who are furthest behind. And often that's the case for migrants. So the next question is why bother with migrant health? Is it, is it important for us? 
uh, it is important and we have to bother because migrants are not just one group of people that we can simply identify and say these are their issues they're heterogeneous the migrant patterns and pathways vary and so you need to have a life cycle approach and epigenetics at the individual level and interestingly both uh, migration and health are not static they are dynamic so understanding these pathways and and particularly the migrant movement will help decipher the positive and negative aspects on health there is also a need to dispel migrant health myths identify and promote what needs to be done there's policy coordination across sectors spanning all the phases of migration and this will avoid duplication prevent illness and save lives uh, there's also a need for a paradigm change very often and i'm going to talk about it a little bit later too migration and migrants is seen as a burden instead we need to change that to an investment in migrant health is an investment in the future migrants should be seen as a resource rather than a burden who has key strategies that include improving health for all and reducing inequalities in health and we can't really do that if we don't pay attention to migrant health and finally universal health coverage cannot be realized unless migrants and refugees among other marginalized groups are also included but not all of them are marginalized so let me give you some other arguments about why migrant health is important and why we should pay attention to the health of migrants so the rights argument the who constitution says that the highest attainable level of health as a fundamental right of every human being to health must be enjoyed without discrimination on grounds of race age ethnicity or any other status so healthcare is a human right and that's also at times debatable in different fora but there is a very strong rights argument the next argument is the economic argument and for those who are not willing to buy the rights argument the economic argument is an extremely strong argument which is health and wealth is connected and macroeconomic analysis on the effect of asylum seekers in europe concluded that positive effect it had a positive effect on host economies uh, uh, host countries economies also migrants in high income countries bolster services they provide medical care teaching children caring for older people supporting understaffed services and this is not me saying it these are findings from the lancet commission so unlike what is commonly thought of migrants are not a burden or they are not making high income countries poorer they do contribute to that and we'll come back to this a bit later and if you're not buying the economic argument there's the crisis argument that when something happens we can't just sit around the world and, and wait for disaster to strike so you have both man made disaster and you have natural disaster and we know the uh, crisis that happened with the in the middle east with syria and and with a lot of people and this is the covid night having to walk back to their home states in india so basically uh, whether the crisis is man made or whether the crisis is natural uh, migrants and refugees will keep trying until they succeed or die the next argument is the anti discrimination argument and we have seen in recent uh, weeks that what is happening across the atlantic and there's there's been a lot of hate campaigns mudslinging against migrants scaremongering deliberate misinformation and outright lies and these arguments really need to be tackled and therefore we need to have both the evidence as well as pay attention to migrant health but at the end of it all uh, whether we pay attention to economic arguments or you have the rights arguments or you have the crisis argument and you have the anti discrimination argument but above all the argument that really makes the difference is the humane argument we are all human beings and i think this picture uh, is very, very says it all and all of you do remember this picture of this young uh, syrian boy who died and um and the french uh minister manuel valls said that it's the migrants are not just faceless nameless they're human beings and said he has a name 
Hailan Kudi. And therefore, if none of the arg arguments appeal to you, at least we have the humane arguments saying why we should bother about migrants and migrant health. So migrants, and we talk about migrants as if they were all one group. And I like to always liken migrants to a, a vegetable fruit basket. Yes, they all have something in common, but each of them also has their own characteristics. I'm sure you'll agree that an eggplant is not the same as a pear. And therefore, there are many, many categories of migrants, the refugees, the, the resettlement refugees, asylum seekers, internally displaced migrant workers, students, au pairs. The list is endless. And of course, they're irregular or undocumented migrants as well. And, uh, and, and many of these definitions, and this list is by no means final. There are many more definitions. For those of you who are interested, please read the glossary of the Migrant Ethnic Ethnicity, Race and Health Conference from Edinburgh. So what happens with migration? And um, there's a migration cycle and it's there's a country of origin and you have a country of destination. And you might think that, okay, that's fair enough, country of origin and country of destination. And maybe uh, in the older days, this transit was very short. Now, this transit is becoming longer with interception and there's a longer term transit. And also there's something else called circular migration. So in this circle of migration, uh, health, well-being of the people who are moving and the populations that move is going to change. And the question is, how does that change? What happens to their health? So what changes? Of course, the physical environment changes and that we see both in terms of internally displaced as well as those who move across border. There are changes in lifestyle, diet, physical activities, smoking, alcohol. There's psychosocial changes. People lose their social network. There's loss of family, friends. There's change in status, profession, societal norms. The rules are all very different. And with all these changes, it is only but natural that health will change. Risk factors will change over time. These changes could be both positive or negative. It's not necessary that they have to be in one direction. And there's of course a life course perspective because unlike what we'd like to think or the immigration authorities would like to think, the life of a migrant does not begin when they arrive at a port or at an airport. It actually begins in the womb. And therefore the life course perspective is important. And then there's also the cycle of Initially, when migrants arrive, there might be euphoria. They have finally arrived in country of destination, but this is often followed by disillusionment. And finally, adaptation takes place. Migration and health research uh, falls uh, often between the cracks, though in the last two decades, it's been strengthening and gaining strength for every year that goes by. And the reason is that migration researchers have looked at the demographics and health research looks at health with very wide lens of public health. And this falls in the cracks. But when migration health started, we had, there, there was a phase in the development in, of the interest in migrant health. So earlier interest was of course in exotic disease. What is different? It's all about the unusual diseases that migrants show up with infections or uh, some other kind of congenital diseases. And then you had the study of biological differences with a focus on some of these congenital diseases like hemoglobinopathies, et cetera. And then we said, okay, we need to really look at population patterns of disease, looking at mental health. But then the group comparison was always looking at the majority population. And in a lot of high income countries, the majority population was white. And finally, we are at the stage where we're looking at uh, adapting healthcare policy, research and services to meet the needs of ethnic minority groups. The challenge is trying to ensure the healthcare system as a whole is primed to meet the challenges of multicultural healthcare and multicultural society. And then we have to look at what are the most common hypotheses we have for migrant health. So one of the most common hypotheses is the healthy mig migration effect, healthy workers, and actually started with the healthy worker. Those who are resourceful migrate and they migrate to find jobs and to re-establish re themselves to be more resourceful also health-wise. And then there's the theory of ill health or negative health that migration might adversely affect uh, health, particularly those starting with 
perilous migrant journeys, or they have already been in jeopardy because of the situation they're, they're leaving. For example, conflict situations, disaster situation, there's a new set of health risks and morbidity and mortality are increased by movement from low risk to high risk. And then there's the allostatic load. And this goes to the core of the immigrants needing uh, need to adjust to a new environment. There's so many things that change. And I, you remember that slide with a lot of changes and stress. So it goes from the healthy migrant to the exhausted migrant. And some other theories, which I don't have the time to go into, but um, you, could, you could also review them is the salmon effect, the acculturation theory of how migrants adopt behaviors, social causation theory, and sometimes it could be, okay, is it, is it really not a problem at all? Are the differences we see in health just statistics? Is it a data artifact? I can assure you it's anything but the last. So if we begin to look at the mediators of migrant status and, uh, and uh, health status, there are different linkages. And what I'd like to say is one of the most common linkages that we know of that is very common is the socio looking at socioeconomic position. And if we look at barriers to integration, which we look at link A, this prevents migrants from realizing their full health potential. And this could be things like access to employment, access to a quality of education, discrimination, et cetera. And then we have link B, that is between socioeconomic position and health, and is issues related to health and safety at work, nutrition, healthy eating, housing and living environment, health awareness and healthy lifestyles. And these moder moderators could also be true for other groups, not just for migrants. And then we have the possible mediators of a direct link between migrant status and health. And this is healthy migrant effect, except for asylum seekers, but you also have various kinds of unhealthy migrant effects, like higher prevalence of some infections, genetic or cultural factors that might either improve or undermine health, and experiences of direct individual discrimination. There are also two health system failures that could be the link between migrant status and health. Negative effects of denying access to good quality healthcare, and failure of health education and health promotion to reach migrants. And just to summarize it all, we have this model that was uh, developed by Esperanza and myself that sort of sums up migrant status relationship to ill health. So it's just about what I talked about. And you will see that it, it really is, everything is connected with everything else. So we can't be looking, and we can't be working just in silos when it comes to migration and ill health. Okay, uh, let's go move forward and see what is known. What do we know? What does the data and research tell us? The Lancet Commission uh, that was, uh, is, is the first report that globally looks at migration and health. And, and basically one of the key findings was that migration is an independent determinant of health. It is not just migrant socioeconomic position and therefore the well-being should be at best as a global health priority. And how the world really addresses human mobility will also determine public health and social cohesion for decades to come. And in general, on an average, migrants are healthier, better educated, and employed at higher rates than individuals in destination locations, but not all. There are issues like laws, restrictions, and discrimination that put them at the risk of ill health. And of course, there are particularly certain groups that are not healthier, are not better educated, and are at risk, like, for example, uh, trafficking victims, irregular migrants, low wage workers, and asylum seekers. The other uh, issue is who are the migrants? And this is a very important thing in terms of the proportion of migrants. And if you follow media, you might think that there's a tidal wave of refugees. And the Lancet migration actually showed that refugees are not the largest group. The largest group of people on work, move, moving are actually labor migrants, and the international group is one. So unlike what is common, popularly believed that the largest group of migrants is refugees, they are among the most vulnerable group, yes, but they're not the largest proportion. 
So what the Lancet uh, Commission did was le looked at some of the myths about migration and health. And these were the ones that were not supported by the available evidence. And some of these myths were, are high income countries being overwhelmed by migrants? Are migrants damaging economies? Are migrants a burden on health services? Are migrants disease carriers that pose risks to resident populations? Do migrants have higher fertility rates than among host populations? I should have had a mentometer and got all of you to answer these questions, but now I'm going to give you the responses instead, uh, since we are not able to do that. So migrants are not burdening economies. An overwhelming consensus of evidence exists on the economic benefits. In advanced economies, each 1% increase in migrants in the population increases the GDP by 2%, per person by 2%. And then the other thing one really forgets is the remittances that migrants sent to their families at origin, and that's a huge amount of money. Migrants are not a burden on the health services, and I will talk about that a little bit more, so I'm not going to talk about it at the moment. And then we have this populist rhetoric. Migrants have many more children than host populations, and they're going to have so many children that they're actually going to overflood uh, the host countries. But this is not true. The growth and decline of migrant populations affected by birth uh, also uh, depend on inward and outward migration. We looked at large scale longitudinal data from six countries and showed that migrants have lower first birth rates than non-migrants with the exception of Turkish women. And the birth rates among migrants were barely at the level of the population replacement, the total fertility rate falling below 2.1 births per woman and often falling. So this again was a myth that they were having many more children and it was not just the next generation, but already after migration, that was not true. So when we look at access to healthcare, we know, and I, I don't have the time to go through all the issues related, but if we say that there are formal barriers and there are informal barriers, and both of these barriers are important, what we know is that it ends up with delay in diagnosis and treatment, and also increases morbidity and mortality. And this is a, a study that was actually from Bergen, also uh, led by my colleague uh, Esperanza Diaz and, and other colleagues. And it showed, again, the myth that actually migrants are not using the emergency services more than the native Norwegians. And you will see in all categories, except for one category, and that is zero to five children. And if you also look at this other study, looking at older migrants, then you see that again, the old proportion of primary health care users by age group, you did not have migrant from other countries as being some of the largest group of healthcare services. So this debunks some of the myths that migrants are overusing health services or they migrated because they wanted to avail of better healthcare services. And in Europe, uh, I'm, and this, uh, in, uh, uh, other than access to healthcare, we, I don't have the time to go into mortality estimates, but the mortality estimates we, which we found in Europe and also in the Lancet Commission are lower uh, for all cause mortality, but could be higher for some infections. At a higher risk for infections, Migrants are at a higher risk for infections themselves, particularly those who have deprived or poor socioeconomic conditions. But transmission from refugees and migrants to host populations are low. The risk for non-communicable diseases increases with duration of stay, as does mortality, as we have seen in some of our studies, especially diabetes, cardiovascular disease through lower risk and uh, the lower risk for neoplasms except cervical cancer. Migration is a risk factor for mental disorders, especially among children and young people, but mental health varies. We've seen also that work-related injuries are higher among migrants. And, and also there is a, a trend for some pregnancy-related indicators to be poorer among migrants. Okay, so what do we do with all of that? We have some knowledge about migrants. We know a little bit about the theories of migration. We know a little bit about uh, who the migrants are. Let's look at what we call the roadmap. And the roadmap is a series of events that have happened internationally um, uh, that have shown us what has happened in the field of migration and health. And I will come back to this roadmap. So in the 20th century, there were two main themes. 
uh, access and quality of healthcare, and this is what was the focus. And health access, I've already talked about in the Lancet Commission, what was really important related to health access was governance issues uh, and looking at access, sub-national, national, as well as international. And really looking at how this access could be uh, improved. And one of the things was by the link of health status to migration enforcement reinforces distrust of the health system and limits migrants' access to healthcare. So what the 21st century hopefully will be seeing, and part of it is underway, is the strong support from international governmental bodies. Initiatives in Europe really didn't get underway uh, until 2007. And we saw the roadmap, but the roadmap in the future will need to discuss the issues of leadership and governance, data and research, and intersectoral collaboration. In Norway, too, we had a Norwegian strategy on migrant health. And this is very important because the governance and leadership at the national level is important. Uh, we also have to look at, and I'm not going to go into this in detail, uh, but this is looking at the Dahlgren model and looking at how this model is also relevant with the migrant in, uh, at the center as an individual, but then there are all these other areas that we have to think of collectively. So what we know versus what we need to know. We've seen a great increase in publications in the past two decades, and we see there are certain areas that are favored, like acculturation, poverty, mental health, but the knowledge produced is not sufficiently used by the policymakers in closing the policy practice gap. So we need to look a little bit more on the causes of the causes. We need to look at preventive interventions. We look, need to look at long-term studies, and we need to see how we can incorporate that in policy. So is research a solution? Research is the basis. However, all research without any user involvement and any kind of, uh, will have limited value. And there's a history of exclusion from research, particularly when it comes to migrant groups. So it's very important to include uh, the migrants right from the start and include the users, not only in research, and in terms of data, but also in policy development and in intersectoral collaboration. Uh, I would like to point out that we, the first Congress on Migration, Ethnicity, Race and Health was held in Edinburgh. And the important thing is that we can't go the path alone. And this was a conference that brought together all the different areas of policy, practice, research, and users. And, and basically, uh, the Edinburgh Declaration says what the collective group of over 750 people that attended uh, basically said, and all of you can go ahead and read that in the Edinburgh Declaration, including establishment of a global society. And while we have the Edinburgh Declaration at the global level, we also have the Bergen Declaration that I'm very proud to also present. And the Bergen Declaration was made at the National Migration Health Conference in Bergen two years ago. And basically the Bergen Declaration also goes into why we need better health for migrants, because it's better health for all, adaptation of services, mapping migration health at educational institutions, work and education as arenas for strengthening migration, increasing access to quality assured interpretation, and research data, adapting health information and teaching materials. But we, don't, we can't stop only at declarations and policies. We also need actions. And, and therefore we have the joint action, which means in the, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a project and a program that is being supported by the EU with 27 countries participating, looking at better cooperation and concrete actions. And important thing with the joint action, which is currently underway, is looking at how we can work with the policymakers, with the stakeholders, and uh, looking at how we can address issues like, it's not our concern, we don't know what to do, that's what we hear very often. We don't know how to do it, we don't want to do it, we really don't want to do it, and we can't afford to do it. I'm sure all of you have heard all of these things. And these are, the, these are areas where governance matters, where evidence matters, and we've got to bring the two together. So the way ahead, there is a mismatch between public perception and current evidence about migration, and we need to change that narrative. We have to change that narrative from being negative and saying all is gloom and doom, 
and look at how we can make this resourceful for everybody. Migration help does not exist in a vacuum. There's a need to address xenophobia and public opinion in order to bridge the policy practice gaps and ensure that evidence-based policies strengthen uh, public health initiatives. We need the evidence and we need to know not only the who and the what, but to understand the how and the why. And to understand the how and why, we really have to work together cross-cutting across sectors and with multidisciplinary teams. So basically, to, in the words of the Lancet Commission, we need a paradigm shift in research on migration and health with deliberate efforts to enhance funding mechanisms and networks supporting this change. And we need strong partnerships with academia, policymakers, and frontline health and humanitarian workers. So the moment for migration is now. Migration is our reality and our future, and it needs to unite us rather than divide us. We have several opportunities, the universal health coverage, the global compact on refugee and migration. We have the WHO strategies. We have Lancet migration. We have the global society on migration, ethnicity, race, and health. And we have UFA section for migration and minority health. And this is just the beginning of the list. There are many more networks, both nationally and internationally that are working together. So in the words of Martin Luther King, I'd like to end by saying, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. And I hope you will try to be the change along with me that you want to see in this world. And I'd like to also acknowledge uh, Esperanza Diaz, uh, David Ingleby, Bernard Rachel Raj Bhopal, Jahi, Lancet Commission, and WHO Europe. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much indeed, Bernadette. As I expected, this was both a learning experience and inspiring. We have already one question that has been posed, and I hope that while we are talking, there will be several persons asking questions in the question and answer section. The first question is about is a clarifying question, I think. What is the difference between international and labor migrants? That is, if you want to answer that one to begin with. Yes, um, that's actually a simple question. Um, labor migrants are a subset of international migrants. What we mean by international migrants are migrants who cross borders. So you can have migration from rural to urban within a country, but international is when they cross borders from one country to another. So I hope that answers that. You sure about it? There will surely more questions to come, but I, I would like to, to challenge you because you, you end up often with that slide that I like very much, be the change that you want to happen. And uh, this is a, a course for researchers where we try to um, invite to making a change in society. At the same time, you can sometimes, especially in a, in a field like migration become what people think is too involved. So my question to you is to your thoughts about this, this balance between being an academic and an academic that changes the world and how that is perceived and how that it could be balanced. And then we have a question afterwards in addition, but you can begin with this one. I think that um, sometimes when we look at how we can change the world, it becomes, uh, very overwhelming for everybody, for all of us. I'm no exception. And then you have to look and say, where am I and what can I do? And if you're a researcher, it's your job to generate good research about migration health. And don't be afraid. For a long time, researchers wouldn't touch mig migration and health because it was too difficult. Migrants were excluded from uh, all, all the surveys because it was too difficult, because the variables are very hard. Because when we conduct surveys, the uh, attendance is very poor. Yes, these are all difficulties. I have also spent many sleepless nights with all of them uh, and saying, what do we do? We have too many missings, et cetera, et cetera. But the idea then is don't give up. Because if you give up, how can you make a difference? So I always say that regardless of um, what you're doing, and, and the difficulties you have. Uh, let's not even talk about recruitment. 
most people want to give up at the stage of recruitment because they can't recruit uh, migrants into studies and service. So I think it's about saying, okay, I will do what I can do within my area. And, and a lot of the PhD students in particular and researchers, uh, it's very frustrating. So I'm not going to say that it's easy. It's, uh, you have to continue despite the fact that it's not easy. So that's my uh, you know, short answer to something that is really quite long. Um, Thank you very much. Um, we have one question from, or oh, this is a hard number to name to say, Omotayo Mitola, I hope it's right. Could you ex explain more on migration being our future? Yes, I think that um, migration has uh, been, let me begin by saying migration has also be, been our past. Uh, migration is not new. It's, it's a human phenomenon. And human beings have always migrated. Now, the ease with which you can migrate, and, and here we have a little caveat, and that is COVID-19, but it's not going to last with us for the rest of our lives, hopefully not. And if it does, we'll still have to move despite COVID-19. Um, it is in human nature to migrate. And therefore, by trying to uh, ignore migration or saying, that we can put up fences, we can stop this interconnectedness. So we, we not only have interconnectedness in, in the world today, we also have interdependency. So globalization is also about interdependency and therefore it is what is the future. We, we cannot go back to being islands or being uh, nation states isolated from each other. I think that's uh, really not a reality and therefore it is part of our future. It's also part of our future because it means that we have to look at migration as being something positive, not just something negative. Thank you very much. As far as I see now, there are no more questions to you. There's somebody who is asking for the slides because they think they were very informative. So. I so I hope that you will be able to share with us afterwards. You might part the, the presentation to us we were talking about. Um, there are no more uh, questions for the time in. I will have one more myself. And, uh, and this is about, you were talking about leadership in your talk. How is leadership important for migration health? I think that leadership is uh, literally the alpha and omega in terms of uh, migration health. And um, the reason is that uh, it is every, every area, every cause needs a champion. And if you don't have uh, leaders who are willing to take up the cause or are too willing to champion and to lead, how can you expect people then follow? And so some people have had to take up the mantle and have had to say, okay, this is an area that's important and this is a reason why it's important. And different leaders at different levels, you will have small local leaders in, in small municipalities, and then you'll have leaders at the national level and you have then leaders at the global level. And migration health needs leaders at all levels. And the reason is because Migration health is not just happening at the global level, it's local, regional, national, and global. And um, leadership is, is important because leaders have to be like the engine that uh, you know fuel all the time, all the carriages at the back. And if we don't have that engine and the energy of that engine, the train will not go forward. And we know that. And so I, I see that as being, but it's not only the leaders who have to carry everything and that would also be completely wrong. So the leaders really have to provide the energy and the fuel to take the agenda forward. Thank you very much. Now I see there's another question or comment. I will read it for you all. It says, thanks Bernadette. I think there are different narratives around migration depending on where and who. For example, expats has a very different feel to immigrants. I guess this is more of a comment, but maybe you have a thought on this? Um, absolutely. And I think that uh, in itself describes how we like to categorize 
issues and how migration has become very negative. And it's not. It's both, you know, as we say, the glass is both half full and half empty. And uh, I think that those are some of the areas that we're going to have to look at uh, in, in, uh, in the future. That uh, when we like the migrants, we call them expats or when they're useful. And when we don't like them, we can we call them um, migrants or illegal migrants or asylum seekers, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's about saying that they're all migrants. And yes, it will be like humanity at large. It will be like populations, uh, some good, some bad. And I think that's one of the things that we'll really have to uh, look at the terminology and say, we, it's not about you know only selecting and saying, we want the highly qualified, highly skilled uh, migrants and we don't want the others who are fleeing from war and we will not have. So it's not only the economic arguments, it's also the humane arguments at the end of the day that matter. Thank you. Two more questions, I see. One is from Anand. How does migrant health interact with climate change? What are the main advocacy measures you suggest focusing on? Yeah, Anand, of course, has opened the Pandora's box. And um, I'm, I'm really not sure that we can, uh, we can uh, respond to that uh, adequately in terms of um, going into all the details. However, uh, climate change means also that people have to move. That's a fundamental issue. And uh, people move because of climate change. And, you know, I'm, I'm sitting in a country where uh, it's definitely happening. We know that there are lots of issues related to the, the Himalayan range, to the, uh, the glaciers that are melting, et cetera, et cetera. And people who were used to a certain way of living, certain livelihoods, they have to move. And when they move, this will also change their health. And therefore, uh, climate change and health is, is basically about migrant health, just so that the climate change people know this is what is really the reality. But, but it is, there's definitely very strong uh, intersections here. And therefore, we have to look at intersectionality in terms of how that will change. Also, the health of those who don't necessarily move, but are affected by climate change, um, and here it can be whether it's droughts and other uh, things that are taking place as a result of climate change, um, their livelihoods will be impacted, their health will be impacted, and it can go in both directions. And a lot of the changes that one sees is actually a change in the negative direction. So I think that one of the things that we're trying very hard, uh, and this is again, uh, Lancet Migration is working extremely hard on that, uh, is not to work in silos. So we're trying very hard and there, there's also the countdown to climate change and Lancet Migration is trying to work very closely with them so that we don't end up in silos because these issues are very interconnected. So we're going to need as researchers, as policymakers, uh, to look at both these issues through the same lens and not be looking at different lens. So that's one of the advocacy measures of saying, that we should really be working on both these issues in a cross-cutting manner uh, and not trying to work on them uh, in silos. That's a, that's a short answer of it. That was a good answer. There's another one, which is another question, which is relatively related. Uh, Lucas writes, I saw many categories of immigrants, labor, refugees, on your presentation. What about the environmental immigrants? Are they also being addressed by health research? You partially answered that one. And what are the main findings on this issue? Well, at the moment, I can say that uh, uh, the work on uh, both climate change and migrant health is just in its start phases. This was one of the main recommendations of the Lancet uh, both UCL Commission, but also of the Lancet migration. So we are still looking at conceptual frameworks. So I wish I had some data at the moment, but in two years, if you ask me that question and I've, if I don't have any data or colleagues don't have any data, then you can take me to task. I think we have a lot. We cannot listen to you now, Bernadette, is that it? Um, you can hear me now. 
I can hear, but I cannot hear Esperanza. So I think it's maybe Esperanza's fault. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so she, it seems like she has dropped off. But okay. um, thank you very much for a very in interesting lecture. I'm the scientific director of this year's Bergen Summer Research School, and and we've uh, I mean one of the reasons we thought uh, your lecture was really interesting, your topic, your profile was interesting for a keynote plenary lecture, uh, was your um, um, the fact that you you work both academically and also in sort of policy related domains, and. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you see that that experience. This is something we've we've discussed a lot at uh, in, in, in different sessions at Bergen Summer Research School. You know, actionable knowledge and using academic insights in policymaking fields and 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 the difficulties and challenges and opportunities of that. Um, absolutely, and I think again, um, what has been very important is that um, I have to say when I have my research hat. Researchers are usually thrilled when their article is published and they think, great, end of the road. Sorry, starting of the road. Hmm. And, and this is where you have to make that bridge because policymakers really uh, don't have the, you know, and it's, it's, it's time, energy, bandwidth, whatever you might want to call it, to actually appreciate your research process. They want to know, you know, the so what question, what do we do with it? And, and therefore, I think now with all research, we talk about dissemination and it's very important with dissemination, but we also need to translate that knowledge because sometimes we understand all our papers, but the policymakers really don't understand that. I mean, COVID-19 case and point. I mean, there are, there are articles and research and papers coming out of our years, but still the policymakers are struggling at all levels and say, so what should we do? What should we do? So I think this is where we need to have more forums for dialogue. Uh, we really need to bring people together. We need platforms to discuss and where research can discuss with policymakers. And we see that in some countries, it's part and parcel of the existence. For example, in Norway, it's not a very unusual thing to have that, but in a lot of other countries, it doesn't happen. And, and globally also, it doesn't happen where you get policymakers or leaders involved uh, in such forums. So therefore we need those forums and we need those platforms to have that dialogue. Yeah. Good, are there any other questions from uh, students? Let me see. Yes, says, <laughs> is, that, is that a question or a comment? <laughs> that was a nice uh, question. Yeah. <laughs> Cam, uh, do you want? Uh, I, I assume you uh, you can turn on your microphone and speak, uh, although I'm not sure. Um, but um, if you want to elaborate a bit on that in your in in the comment uh, section, uh, and also Esra has has raised her hand. Um, let me see if I can. And I see the question on uh, comment on migration and agricultural economy. So yeah. while Hova, you're trying to look at, uh, let me see if they can. Yeah, I will. I will try to respond to migration and agricultural economy. Hmm. Great. I think that. Um, yeah, I think that uh, one of the things that is really important is uh, migration is of course changing uh, rural societies especially the rural to urban migration. And because of that, uh, it's definitely going to affect agricultural economies. At the same time, agricultural economies are not what they used to be 25 years ago, 30 years ago. They're also being modernized. So I think uh, one has to have the two things going hand in hand. And if one doesn't have the two things going hand in hand, in other words, looking at sustainable development in its entirety, then it will be a problem. And, and the similarly, you know, if you want to add the climate change issue to it in terms of agricultural economies, uh, that will also be uh, a, a really serious problem. So I think when one looks at migration, one also has to look at, uh, yes, and one can't really stop uh, people from migrating. People are going to migrate. So if, if you want people not to move, and you want them to stay where they are, then you have to make sure that the conditions they have 
uh, where they are are conducive to livelihoods, conducive to them uh, being there. Great. So I figured out the technical solution. I got some quick technical help uh, to get uh, participants uh, to talk. And uh, now, Ngam, did you get your answer? No, your uh, your question answered. I can allow you to talk if you uh, if you want. Do you want to elaborate, or did you get your uh, your question answered? Yes, you can speak. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yes, um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Kuma. Now, I, I want to elaborate on what you just said now. When you look at migration with agricultural economy, you know, for instance, in sub-Saharan Africa, sub-Saharan regions, like sub-Saharan the tropics, most especially, where we like, like in Africa, like in South America, okay, we know that the bulk of the food that is being produced are by these um, rural, in the rural areas, by the peasants, small-scale farmers, all right? And if they get to migrate from the rural areas to the urban centers where, they, okay, they're looking for um, fast life, you know, um, white collar jobs and all that. The number of hands that would produce the food that you know is required would be, would be limited. And coupled with the increase, the teaming population, looking taking Nigeria for instance, a populated country in Africa. All right. If you look at that, for instance, and you look at migration, people migrating from the rural setting to the urban setting. The number of people work hands that would you know in, in, um, produce food for the population is is limited. All right. So I'm looking at migration has its 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 good side, but its bad side, which I'm looking at from the agricultural perspective, is very important because if people are hungry, nothing else matters. All right. Not the technology, not the every, everything boils down to having stomach that are not hungry, people that are well fed, and of course, if you if, if feed well, of course. You say he who eats well, you know, gets to be more healthy. Now, I don't know if that's really true, but let's look at from that perspective. People migrating from the rural setting where bulk of the food is produced to the urban centers. What happens? How does it affect the? So that's that's where my comments is coming from. I hope you um, you probably expatiate more on that. Thank you. Great, thank you. Yeah, I completely agree. So it's not as if um, uh, migration. It's not a good and bad thing. It's about a phenomenon that takes place. And then sometimes it's to the detriment of others and it also jeopardizes food security. And that's why I was back, that's, and you didn't mention that actually when this kind of migration happens, the other burden, and I can just talk about, for example, a country like Nepal, where um, the women are left with taking care of several generations and taking care of the agriculture. So it becomes a, a triple burden for them. So it, it is problematic and the rural to urban migration is problematic. At the same time, you have to look and see where therefore you need overall development. Uh, and the overall development has to be looked at, uh, looking at how uh, things in the rural areas are improved. For example, if there are no schools in the rural areas, then people will move. If there are no health services in the rural areas, people will move. So I think if you if you expect want people to stay in a particular area, then it becomes a responsibility of governments to take care of that. And and often that is what happens. There is a failure in the system to provide uh, people with or fulfill their needs. And because of the unmet needs, they they move. And it, the, 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 the consequences of that are quite disastrous. Great. No, Esperanza is back, but I uh, I took yeah. control of the seminar. But <laughs> sorry about that. That's in the region a link that was even worse than the, the one in Nepal. There is one question, but I don't know if that was the one you were answering already. It says I wanted to ask about what can be done on the ground for the most suffering migrants on the on the ground to raise their their access to health living to healthy living. But maybe Dr. Kumar has answered that question already. Well, there are two questions here on um, that have not been answered on on sort of what can be done on the ground. I think both by the media and sort of in general of intervention. So maybe you could just um, answer that sort of what what can be done on the ground for migrants' health. Uh, and I think that's that's probably the final question uh, answer we have we have time for. Yeah. And then maybe Esperanza will just want to wrap up and 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 say thanks after that. Yes. Yeah. 
Uh, I'll, I'll start with the fact that uh, what uh, with the media and uh, the media is extremely important, but there are two kinds of media today. There's media and there's social media. And sometimes one can also address issues through social media. And we've seen that that's also been very useful, uh, particularly when it comes to migrant health. I think that one of the ways to engage the media and the media is very important in changing the narrative is really to try to, as we did with the Lancet Commission, debunk some of the most popular myths that have been there and say, this is the evidence, which means also that researchers and other stakeholders, including the migrants themselves, have to engage with media. So that's about the intervention on media. On the ground, I think one of the most important things, which has been left out for a very long time, researchers are very good with producing the data, policy makers are sitting and making policies, but nobody's actually asking the migrants, what is it that you need? What is your need? What is, uh, what is unmet? And I think if you want any success on the ground, you need to have the migrants with you. You need to have, that was one of the slides that I had, is nothing about me without me. And uh, they have to be with. We're, we have to stop doing things for migrants. We have to do things alongside with. They have to be an integral part of the team. And also, nobody can go this road alone. It's not, not, not meant to be that. So I think it's very important that we look at how we can collaborate. And collaboration on the ground is extremely important between, and I think Bergen is a, is a very good example in COVID-19. And for those of you who don't know, uh, Esperanza is leading up a project where you have uh, the University of Bergen, where you have the municipality of Bergen, you have the Center for Undocumented Migrants, and this is completely unprecedented. So it can happen, there is hope. And I would like to end on the note and say, you know, what we thought was not possible is possible. So we just have to dream a little bit and we have to work a lot. Well, thank you very much, Bernadette. I don't think I can wrap up better than you did just now. Uh, so on those words of collaboration, um, a holistic view and including those that we are studying within the studies and the possibility of working through the different um, fields and through the different groups of people, I think we can end the talk today. Thank you very much for being with us today, even though it's late there. And then um, thank you very much for the day today to all participants and we see each other tomorrow. Thank you. Thank very you. Much.